Porting KDE apps to Android and why we care. My agenda for today is, first I want to explain why we care about Android, because after all, we're writing our own Android competitor. Why do we care about Android? Where are we now with supporting KDE software on Android? How hard is porting things to Android? And most importantly, how it is done. Why do we care? Android has definitely more than 1 billion, maybe even more than 2 billion users. That's a lot. That's about a billion times more than we do. <laughs> and this includes most of us at the moment. And porting our apps to Android is a very good opportunity for us to be able to actually test our own applications um, in a day-to-day -day usage, which is a very important part of developing them. And it's also a good way of growing the number of users that are maybe not, maybe don't even want to use Plasma Mobile, but still want to use cool privacy respecting applications on Android. And every user is in some way a potential contributor, so we can also grow the number of potential contributors. Where are we now? Uh, we have 28 applications built for Android on the binary factory. Actually, it's 29 because I didn't count Krita because Krita being Krita does its own weird thing and it doesn't show up in our usual Android view. But apparently it works on Android. <laughs> Seven of them are on Google Play already and three of them are on F-Droid. So before anyone <laughs> tells me that, oh, why are we so much more on Google Play than on F-Droid? F-Droid is much better, yes, I I agree, but it's also having things on F-Droid and getting things there is a bit more involved because on Google Play, we just create an APK and upload it there and be done with it. On F-Droid, it's a bit more complicated because they do all those uh, nasty things of wanting to check that your application is actually built from your source and that it's trusted and this kind of thing. So what they do is they build all of the applications themselves and what you need to do is provide a kind of build recipe to them where these this steps for building these apps are defined, which is usually pretty easy for the usual Java Gradle-based builds, but it's actually really tricky to do for our Qt-based applications that have a lot of dependencies. But it's certainly possible. Uh, I have uploaded Ktrip there. The build script is only like a hundred lines of bash. It's awesome. Yeah, I need, really need to do something about that. Okay, anyway. How hard is porting to Android? There's, the answer clearly is it depends. It depends on what your application is doing. Uh, there are some things that make porting hard. Those are Qt widgets. Qt widgets are not a problem on Android themselves. They usually just don't make very touch and mobile friendly UIs. But if you have a widgets application that works on a, on a phone a phone form factor, then you can also port it to Android. Second thing that makes things hard with Dbus, because Dbus does not exist on Android. And apps that inherently make use of require Dbus are probably not going to be runnable on Android. Our Android build is a bit weird because it actually does provide Dbus with a giant hack, but it's, it's not really useful because you can't do anything with it. And so you usually need to make sure that you have if theft out all the Dbus usage. 
Another thing that is tricky, but usually does not appear that much in KDE stuff, is uh, things that are specific to glibc. Because Android does not use, use glibc, it uses Bionic. So sometimes things can go wrong there. But since there are other distributions that don't, leap, don't use uh, glibc, it's usually not a problem in our software. Something else that makes it hard is weird build systems. Our stuff is usually fine. It's mostly third-party dependencies that can be a bit of a pain, especially uh, you need to be able to cross-compile things, which some build systems make harder than others. And what's also usually a non-starter is esoteric uh, multi-process architectures, because on Android, things are typically constrained to a single process. And usually also is very focused on the application is only running when it's on the screen. There are ways to run in the background, which gets increasingly hard to do. But yeah. Then how it is done, it's actually really easy. You just need to call CMake with the correct arguments. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. It is easy in theory, but in practice, it can be very tricky. Uh, if you want to check out the uh, Ktrip build recipe for Android, it shows every single command that is needed to get a build for Android, and it's horrible. Because it, it's it's very repetitive. You need to do like the, the same five or six commands for every frameworks dependency, and that's why we have a different solution for that. And like all the cool things, it's built on on Docker, or is Docker even still cool? Anyway, um, yeah. All right, so let's start this Docker container. It's basically, uh, it's called KDE org slash Android SDK. I have uh, some volumes defined here so that I have my source code on my host system and just uh, ex expose that to the Docker container. So. So uh, the way I build an application is there's a, a bunch of helper scripts in in opt helpers. The most important one is the build dash generic one. And here you just pass an application name. So for example, ktrip. And then it works kind of similar. Uh, like KD source build, so it downloads all the dependencies and then builds them. That can take quite a long time on the initial build. In that case, it should be a bit faster because I've already built it. But yeah, let, let me. Yeah, maybe we can. Wait until it's finished. So uh, basically, what this script does is first it checks the source code of your application for which uh, which executable is actually going to be built. So it does that by invoking a script called get apk args, which uh, checks your Android manifest for a key where you define your executable. So if you have an, a, a project that defines multiple executables, you need to pick which one should get converted into the application. And uh, what it does is it generates some CMake arguments for that that, that are getting passed to CMake. Then it's calling the uh, KDE build metadata for getting the dependencies. So this script only works with uh, KDE applications. And then it 
builds them with the right CMAC argument, installs them into some place, and then it builds the actual application. Uh, all that doing, uh, all compiling is done with the compiler from the Android native development kit. And once that's done, it's calling the actual APK creation step, which is as easy as cre uh, calling make cre create dash APK. And in the end, there's an APK falling out that you can then install your device and have fun with it. Um, so this container is pretty much only uh, designed to work on existing KDE applications, but you often also want to start a new application that is not yet on KDE. And there are ways in which you can get that working too. I will show you that in a minute once this is finished. Or, yeah, let me just interrupt that. So, Does the container deal with external dependencies for which the CI needs the custom JSON blob? Yeah, the, the scripts are product of the container, right? Um, the way external dependencies work usually is when you are when they are CMake based, it's really easy because there's a helper script called opt helpers build CMake. And then you pass in a project name, like for example, the iCal, which is used for KCAN on the core, and then you pass in the URL to the repository, so like https github.com slash libiCal libiCal, and then that works. What you also can do is build a framework like a K core add ons framework. It works too, and that's what the, the build generic script is calling internally. So, um, some dependencies are a bit more tricky, for example, OpenSSL or others. For those, we usually have wrapper scripts. So for example, we have a build poplar script. Oh God. Which is just a bash script that does all the necessary steps to compile poplar. And if you want to use a dependency that, that's, that we don't have a script for, you are encouraged to add a script. And then in the binary factory job configuration, you need to tell it which scripts to run for your application. Um, so actually, in theory, the Docker container is very easy if you just want to get an app, get an application, which is uh, just get an APK. It's just uh, running the Docker container, and then in the end, the APK falls out. So for KDE applications that are already set up, it's really, really easy to get an APK. It gets a bit more tricky if you want to make new apps and also have it in a way that's easier to hack on the source code. Now, so the, the way the dependency um, specification works is um, in, in the JSON thing, you have this thing called dependencies, and they just write an opt help us build popular, and then automatically, when Ocular is built popular, gets built as well. All right, so let's assume we have our own application that we want to build that is not yet on KDE. So what I usually do is, I call the um, optopus get apk args on some existing app. 
which, okay, just ignore the fail, that's not a failure, gives you these two arguments, and then you replace a ktrip with your own executable name. Then you copy that. And then you can just call the um, opt helpers build cmake thing with your app. Git and then you can paste those um, opt up parameters. Uh, at the end and then it should build your app and then what you also need to do is go into the other uh, then it builds everything but the apk and then you can go to the build directory and manually invoke make create apk which does not work right now because I canceled the build earlier, but in theory that should output your APK to somewhere in the build directory, and then you can either uh, have a volume that automatically puts it on your disk or block SCP it out of the container and run it on your phone. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Yeah, um, the, the whole article on the Docker container could use a bit of extension for all the tricks I just showed you. Okay, so now you want to port a new app. There's a few steps you need to do always, and then there's a few things you need to take care of if you're using certain like, patterns or things. What you always need to have is an Android manifest.xml, which technically you can do without, but yeah, you you don't really. Uh, usually I just copy that from some other project and then just replace the names because it's mostly boilerplate. There is a thing inside which sets the android.app.lib name thing and that must match your executable name and I usually put the android manifest into a subfolder called android you can name that anything you like but that's one of those parameters that gets uh, set or gets extracted from this get apk arcs thing so if you do that manually you need to check that this is pointing to the right directory. And in the same folder as the Android manifest, you also put the Android specific uh, Java source files, if you have any, and your resource files like your app icon, which you need to put into Android slash res slash drawable. And then you can reference it from the Android manifest with at drawable slash the file name. What you also need to do is go to your main method and mark that as exported because else Android can't, can't find it. And you do that by just putting a queue decal export in front of it. So when you start it up now, it hopefully shows up, but you will notice that it doesn't have any icons at all, which is bad, but luckily there isn't there's a fix. And so um, that's when you're loading your icons from the icon theme. And to do to make that possible, you actually need to bundle your icons into your APK. Um, this is done with the Kirigami package breeze icon CMake macro, which um, yes, this automatically includes the icons that Kirigami uses internally, I think. Um, and then you you put that into somewhere in your CMake, usually with an if Android around it, 
And here is the bit ugly part where you need to specify every icon that your app uses in some way and it should be bundled inside. It's, it's a bit ugly, but I don't really know how it would be done better because you don't want to, want to bundle all Breeze icons because then your APK size would be huge. And what you also need to take care of is actually including the Qt SVG lib because else your SVG icons wouldn't be able to re be rendered. And that's done by linking your application against Qt 5 SVG manually, which you usually don't need to do on the desktop, but need to do here so that Android deploy Qt, that's the tool that, convert, that makes your APK, knows that it's important and needed. So what else needs to be done? Some applications or libraries use plugin systems. And to, to make them work, you need to tell Android Deploy Qt that the plugins should be bundled into the APK. So. Um, one example where this is done is kpeople, where it needs to bundle the data source plugins. And this is done by first defining a, a kpeople-android-dependencies.xml file, where in the file you describe which plugins from which folders will be included. And then that file needs to be installed into the library location and then Android Deploy Cube will pick up those files. So uh, two examples, uh, as I said, kpeople makes use of it. kpeople currently has an issue, which I discovered while preparing for this talk, but I wasn't able to fix it yet. But the fix is uh, quite uh, simple, is that with Q514, the way this is done uh, changed a bit. And knotifications actually does the right thing. So check the source code on that and how it's done. Something else that can be tricky is file paths because um, usually we're, sometimes we assume files are present in a certain location on the desktop, but it's not true on, the, on, on Android because on Android, Usually, you can only see the the own private your own private file storage, but to access the the general file storage, you need to get consent from the user to do that. And this is especially tricky with uh, Q standard paths generic data location, which is not accessible by default unless you request the permission. So consider always using app data location for this kind of things. And if you have uh, files like an image for the default avatar, then you shouldn't rely on that thing being present in the file system, but consider uh, bundling those things in your resources. Sometimes you might need to write and code that is specific to Android, or you have code that shouldn't be run on Android. Um, in CMake, you can use if Android or if not Android to guard Android specific code. From C++, there's the uh, QoS Android define that you can check for before using Android specific code or if in dev QoS Android for code that shouldn't be compiled for Android. Um, just a cute module called Qt Android Extras that provides some useful API for some basic things. For example, dealing with the Android permission system. There are cute repos for that. And uh, for some things, you will need to call the Android Java API with the Java native interface, which is really ugly usually. Uh, Qt Android Express has some wrappers for this kind of things that make it a bit less ugly, but it's still not really pretty. 
Uh, we have solutions for some problems like creating notifications inside K notifications, and we're looking into expanding the capabilities of our KDE frameworks on Android. And if you have any solutions for these kind of problems that fit into the scope of KDE frameworks, then we are very happy to receive uh, contributions for that. So a few resources. Um, yeah, the code is documentation enough, obviously. No, it's, uh, I'm only half joking because I learned most of what I know about putting things to Android by looking at how itinerary does it. And you can, you can get quite far with that. Uh, and doubt the Qt has a lot of documentation on running Qt apps on Android. There's unfortunately not that much documentation about KDE specifics. And we also have um, a matrix channel with all the people interested in Qt on Android, so consider joining that. First K Android extras, will it become a standalone library at some point? Um, yes, assuming there's interest in that. So, but yeah, that's the general idea. So if you if there is something in there you want to use, then talk to Volker and he can extract that. All right. Questions. Um, what kind of things are you talking about exactly? Because usually for like some things in itinerary where we have Android specific code is things like brightness control, screen lock inhibition. For that we have uh, frameworks that do those kind of things on the desktop. So that would be a natural place to put it there. If it's really just generic Android things, then K Android extras could make sense. Um, what I usually do is ADB install and then the APK. There is also a target in the make file that is called make install APK or some or something like that, which should send it to the phone automatically. 